here with my friend Odelia Liu, a fellow writer and translator who I met through Columbia's MFA program. And both of us translate Chinese poetry, but Odelia translates contemporary poetry while I work with classical Chinese poetry. And so we were interested to see how our approaches overlapped and how they were also different. And the poem I wanted to share with you today was originally written a thousand years ago during the Song Dynasty by Li Qingzhao. She's known today by many people in China as their greatest, most celebrated woman poet, particularly for her works in the genre known as Ci, which were composed to the tunes of popular songs in her day. And the two poems I'll read are both set to the tune of Ru Meng Ling. So when I read it in Chinese, you'll notice the rhythms and rhyme schemes of the two are the same. 长记西亭日暮沉醉不知归路兴尽晚回舟误入偶花深处争渡争渡惊起一滩欧路昨夜与书风骤浓睡不消残酒试问卷帘人却到海棠依旧知否知否应是绿肥红瘦 And now in English Just a dream for Li Qingzhao Don't I think it often Your blurry face by the creek Our pavilions in the dusk Thrilled to death, we turned our boat, paddled through scattered fronds, and lost our way. Where did we cross? I fought for the oar and heard wings flap in the drunken dark. Night winds like hooves tossed up broken bits of rain. Sleep never eases the crush of wine. When she spreads the curtain, I try my question. She speaks yet. Your crabapple tree looks the same. No, she doesn't know. It must be fully green, just a few petals left. And now Odelia. Thank you, Kevin. That was wonderful. I remember her as one of my favorite poets, and I remember memorizing both of these poems. Thank you so much for sharing your translation. So in a different vein, my poet's name is called Chen Yanxi. He was born in Shanxi, China in 1970. He's a Chinese worker poet who writes contemporary poetry and essays. He worked as a miner in a blaster for tunnels and migrated all over the country for demolition works for over 16 years. Uh, his first poetry collection, Blasting Log, was published in 2019. And Eleanor Goodman was the first to translate some of his works into English in her book, um, Iron Moon, an anthology of Chinese worker poetry. And there are two poems of him I would like to share with you. One is called Tang Renjie, and the other is the title poet called Blessing Long. Tang Renjie, Zao Yi Mei Ola Tang Ren. Mo Sheng Zhe de Jie Xiang, Jin Tian Zou Guo Wo Men. Jie Shu, Zheng Luo Xia Ye Zi. 像我这一年的过错，所剩已经不多。在一个转角，巨大的牌楼上竖着廉耻。这人间早已遗弃之物，与一群褐色的鸽子，在高高的大理石上栖息。我有一位要好的朋友，在一些年头里，我一直叫他
and sometimes leave her behind. 炸裂之，早晨起来头像炸裂一样疼。这是大机器的额外馈赠，不是钢铁的错，是神经老了，脆弱不堪。我不大敢看自己的生活，它坚硬、悬黑，有风稿的锐角，石头碰一碰就会流血。我想告诉你，我在五千米深处打发中年，我把岩层一次次炸裂，借此把一生重新组合。我微小的亲人远在商山脚下，他们有病，身体落满灰尘。我的中年才下多少，他们的晚年就能延长多少。我身体里有炸药三吨，他们是隐性部分，就在昨夜，在他们床前。我岩石一样，轰的炸裂一地。Blasting log. Waking at daybreak with an exploding headache, another gift from the great machine. It is not the fault of iron and steel, but my aging nerves too brittle for pain. I am afraid to look at the life I live, hard metallic black, with a jackhammer's acute end. When it touches a rock, it bleeds. I want to let you know I am five kilometers deep, squandering middle age. I blast layers of rock over and over to reassemble a life. My minuscule parents, at a distant foot of Mount Shang, are sick. Their bodies covered in ash. How much I trim from my years is how much I can add to theirs. My body carries three tons of dynamite, and there are the fuse. Last night by their bed. I became the rock that, in a boom, was blasted into pieces on the ground. Thank you, Odelia. Just to start off our discussion, I was curious: How did you come to Chen Yanxi and his poetry?、Um, I remember it was the summer of 2020. I was watching a Chinese documentary on six worker poets called "What the Shipian,"、um, it's the verse of us,、uh, which is what actually Eleanor Goodman's book is based on. And among the six poets that I featured, Chen Yanxi caught my attention the most. The style of his language is very simple and unique, like colloquial sometimes, and you can sense like a powerful energy in some of his poems, and almost as if they have a life on their own. Especially the Jalie、um, Zhi poem. There's a kind of explosive energy that really, res- really resembles what he does for a living. So after that, I looked for more of his poems online, and I was really captivated by his perspective, his ways of seeing, and just his personality. And even though there is a huge gap between our experiences, I really resonate with the emotions and nostalgia he holds, and just had the sudden urge that I really want to translate his poems.、Um, And also, since many people have the preconception that、um, blue-collar workers do not know how to appreciate beauty or write beautiful poems, I think an essential part of my job is to disrupt this very class-oriented, very institutionalized idea of how one ought to create and appreciate art. And through translating his poems, I want to show that one does not have to have a high education to express what they feel through words and verses and do it successfully. And so I got really lucky. I found his contact on WeChat. I asked him if he was interested in his works being translated into English. He was very kind and very glad, very generous about.、It. And I do have a question for you too. And based on what I know of your works, since I remember reading some of、uh, your drafts for the ancient Chinese poems, and it is in a way very similar to your own diaspora experience. And So I wonder, since when have you become interested in translating ancient Chinese poetry?、Um, so, what's your relationship to the poems like? Right. I think this is a common experience for a lot of people who were educated in China.、Um, you learn these poems as a child in elementary school and memorize them. And I think back then they were just. Um, mysterious things that I didn't really understand, but they were explained to me in this really,、um, I guess, textbook way. And I guess those interpretations are 
sanctioned by the state since those textbooks were also coming from like publishing houses in Beijing. And and after that, after I came to the US, I still had the poems and I still remembered lines from them or my parents would recite them in their daily conversations, almost like idioms. So I became interested in coming back to them after I had read a lot in English and after I started reading other translations of Chinese poetry, I wanted to complicate that tradition of English translations of um, classical Chinese poetry. And I also want my translations to reflect where I am now in this in-between space between these two imperial languages and um, to reflect what I read and also expand what's possible in English. So I was curious how you have this balance between form, the way the poem looks and sounds, and meaning in your translation. I'm sure we both have similar and different approaches for that. Yeah, I think this is a really common question, especially when it comes to translating poetry. And balancing, it's certainly a difficult thing to do. And then usually um, by, like, decide based on the poet's motivation behind each moment. If the structure itself is meant to draw attention to the shi yan, which is like a key image or line that sums up the quintessence of the poem, then I would definitely try to maintain the structure. Um, for example, by using multiple enjambments um, or extending, say, like the last line of the blasting lock, for example. So, uh, so it sticks out and draws attention. Um, but most of the time, I attempt to consider the meaning and sentimentality first so that what's on the page could be as accessible and as it is truthful and authentic to the reader's experience. And sometimes having a rigid form could kind of compromise that. And especially when it considers like Chen Yanxi does not really use a lot of fancy vocabulary. And it makes sense uh, considering like the community he's from and the community he's trying to build. So in this case, the grandiose word choices or like the complicated syntax structures would have shut out many fellow workers as well as audiences from underprivileged and underrepresented backgrounds. So I think making his voice the pivot point of all the human emotions and experiences that are introduced is more crucial to me than um, like having every line be the same with the original. Um, yeah, and what you said really reminds me of um, like a concern that I have um, when I think of translating uh, Tang Shi Song Si, um, which is that they tend to have a really standard structure. And how do you resolve translating, like you said, the rhyme scheme, the meter, the symmetry in each poem? And for example, I uh, saw that you deployed like different methods to translate Zheng Du, Zheng Du, and Zhi Fou, Zhi Fou. I think you're muted, Kevin. Oh, you're so right. Okay, my bad. Uh, we, I was just uh, going to share screen and take a look at what Odelia was talking about. The line in question is Zheng Du, Zheng Du. And I translated it as, uh, where did we cross? I fought for the ore. And uh, the way I came to that was, um, so you could translate this using also a repetitive word in English that imitates that rhythm, like crossing through, crossing through. But I didn't feel like this was that kind of poem. And in classical Chinese, this zheng is similar to the, the word zima, the zin. It's It means how, or it's like an exclamation. So it's an adverb that then modifies this du, which means to ferry or to cross. And so I wanted to convey both the sense of the, the speaker wondering how they got home that night, but also Zheng in contemporary usage is far more likely to be interpreted as struggle or to fight. So I think I saw an opportunity to have this 
sense that the speaker and her lover were fighting for the oar playfully in the boat. And so I added that piece, I fought for the oar. And that leads nicely to the final line where their roughhousing startles a flock of herons. It's the same choice for Zhifo. Um, and the way I did that one is no, she doesn't know. Um, it just gives a sense of the relationship between the speaker and the person rolling up the curtain. I had a similar question for you. It's uh, your choice to translate Tang Ren. So it's in the title of the poem Tang Ren Jie, and Tang Ren Jie is typically translated as Chinatown. Um, and, and that it's the same Tang as Tang Dynasty. And then every time that word comes up again, it is translated into romanized pinyin tangren and capitalized. So I was curious how you made that decision. And it made me think too, how no Chinese, Mandarin Chinese speaking person would actually call themselves tangren. So it is kind of an absurd concept. Yeah, this, uh, this is a choice that I had a lot of fun deciding on. Um, yeah, um, the, so the concept of Chinatown, at least the English um, translation of the Chinatown, is kind of a new concept in English. The word is coined, I think, in mid-19th century. Yeah. And whereas the word Tangren has been used for thousands of years in China, and different from Zhongguoren or Huaren, um, it doesn't necessarily mean Chinese like these two words do. And if you think about it, even the word Chinese could be so vague considering how the history of China's geography keeps shifting through time. Um, but you're right about the absurdness of Tangren since it's more archaic in colloquial language, like newer generation just doesn't call Chinatown Tangren Jie. Um, and it also refers to Tang people like the Tang Dynasty. Um, I think one of the main reasons I chose to keep the romanization is that Tangren on the tongue has this poetic impression of endearment to it. It also sounds really beautiful. And since it is bizarre to refer to a friend as Chinese, I decided to sacrifice the familiar turn of Chinatown and replace it with Tang and Town. In this way, I hope to keep the, to, to be faithful to the tenderness of this address while still keeping town as hopefully a visible clue for Chinatown. And yeah. I think yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that'll make the reader do some work on their own if they don't have the Chinese, um, and I'm all for that. Exactly. There is another choice you make in Zha Lie Ji, in the second poem that you read. There's this line towards the end. The speaker is uh, seems to be standing in front of his parents' bed. So Yang is like, I was like a rock, but you translated that as became the rock. And I was wondering what went into that decision. That's a really good question because um, before you mentioned that, I actually didn't think of um, just literally translate that line. Now I'm thinking of the different possibility of like rephrasing the sentence. So I was the rock or I was like the rock that in a boom was blasted into pieces on the ground. Um, I think the two was there could be a little bit clunky. And I think the impression that this line gives me is that the poet did not actually draw the parallel between him and the rock he blasts until that particular moment, uh, which is actually an occasion that he didn't specifically explain in the poem and other people wouldn't know. It was um, that night that Chen Yanxi uh, learned that his mother was diagnosed with esophagus cancer and it was at terminal period. So there was all of a sudden a lot of responsibility on him taking care of the whole family on top of already having a half paralyzed father. So I think became, um, so the verb comes off like stronger in this last line of the stanza, preparing the reader before the, mo the, the, mo the movement, the motion of blasting at the end. Yeah, so that's how I decided to go with that. And I think we're almost at time. So this is uh, what's coming is the last but not least question, um, which a lot of translators like to 
offer and a lot of people like to ask translators uh, is what's your translation process like? Um, for this poem, well, it starts from deciding which poem to translate. And, and that's a huge, often political choice. Um, when I read this poem for a translation project more than a year ago um, in the original Chinese, there was just this emotional space that opened up inside of me. And what's really important in my translations, what I prioritize is the emotional effect and, and how it could speak to my experience in between English and Chinese. So I, I would just give it a first shot with a first draft and then put it aside sometimes for months and then come back. Um, and I would also maybe consult my mother and how she remembers the poem, what she thinks about the decisions I made. Um, and Chinese encyclopedias are huge. I would go to them and read their interpretations of the poem, like how you translate the ancient Chinese into modern Chinese, um, looking at the way Chinese people online talk about the poem in online forums, kind of like Yahoo Answers, and seeing how the poem still stands as a popular object, what lines really stick with people, what lines are gonna be inscribed in boardrooms, um, and I, for this, uh, for Li Xingzhao specifically, I read a book by Ronald Egan. He's an East Asian scholar, and the book is called The Burden of Female Talent. It's a really fascinating work on how readers across history since Li Xingzhao wrote this poem have interpreted her poem and the story of her life based on what they wanted her to do for, for them. Um, and I really appreciated Egan's conclusion, which is that we need to see her life in on her own terms. And yeah, uh, other than that, I, I consult the dictionary, of course, and um, read other books of translation in, in English and lit mags and anthologies. And I get feedback from other poets or just um, other Chinese speakers. And I'll bounce this question back to you. How do you translate? What is your process from beginning to end? Um, first of all, I want to echo, echo you on the, um, like your usage for, by doing online forums. I definitely rely on that a lot, um, especially because Chen Yanxi, like use a lot of like professional terminology, such as a tool, smiters and demolitionists often use and also use the um, by doing online forum and Wikipedia to learn more about like the historical and literary references that he deployed in the poems. So um, for my process, I'm still experimenting and trying to find a process that works for me. Um, but for the first draft, I usually have the original by my side when I do a really rough first draft and without thinking too much about how to refine it. And then I do a second draft where I play with all the potential word choices, syntaxes, tenses, rhythms, and then let it sit for a while, like for weeks, for months. And I do, I like to do my third draft on paper where I will copy the previous draft down as I read over it, I'll make more revisions, check whether the translation flows and whether the choices foreignization and domesticization are what I like them to be. In, for example, in the case of Tang Ren Tang, how, uh, whether I should translate it as Tang Ren or Chinatown. And also like ask a poet friend to read it for me. Um, yeah, and sometimes there are more drafts between this one and the final version, but it is really a case by case basis. And yeah, I think in your case, oh, something that I'm really jealous of is that you have a whole community of the previous translators and people translating with you. And it's not a it's not a really solitary process. Whereas um, I feel like in my case, um, I will have I have kind of a lot of weight on my shoulder, like translating it for the some of his poems for the first time. But the good thing is um, the perk of my poet being alive is just that I can just go ahead and ask him, and he's been really friendly and responsive. So yeah, really appreciate that. Yeah, um, I will say you're also shining a light on a on a voice in our 
that that's existing in our present moment. And that's something I get frustrated with, which is why I, I do also turn to living poets as well. But it's certainly true that for these ancient poets, they've been translated many times. And so I think I could do more experimental things with um, how I represent the work. And with that, thank you all so much for watching. And I hope everyone keeps reading, writing, and translating. <laughs>